Okay, welcome everyone. Just as people are coming in, it's really lovely to have you joining us this afternoon. My name's Amy Harrison and I'm the Community Manager at Bristol Green Capital Partnership. And I've had the absolute pleasure of coordinating the Bristol Community Plan Action Project over the last 18 months. Before we get started, I would just like to share a few practical housekeeping things with you. So you'll know that the event is being recorded and we will be sharing that recording after the event for any of those who couldn't be here today. The chat, as you know, is live and we'd encourage you to make use of it. We will be sharing useful links throughout the event. So do keep a lookout. We are also using Zoom webinar for this event, so we'll only be able to see the speakers. However, there's plenty of opportunity for you to interact through the chat and the Q&A functions. Thanks to all of you who have pre-submitted questions when you booked your place at the event. We'll be responding to a selection of these later on in the session. If, however, you didn't get a chance to pre-submit a question or, however, a new question springs to mind as you listen to our speakers this afternoon, then you can also submit a question live to our speakers this afternoon via the Q&A and you can also upvote other people's questions as well. And we aim to um, respond to a selection of those live questions as well as some of the pre-submitted ones during the Q&A session later. So we've got a really packed hour and a half of presentations and discussion up until 3 p.m. Do please share the conversation through your social media channels, both during and after the event. We will be live tweeting throughout this afternoon and links to social media handles and hashtags will be going in the chat now. So I think that is all for the practical information. So without further ado, um, we'll get started with the content. I'll just... Uh... Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so welcome. This afternoon, we'd like to share some of the insights developed through the Bristol Community Climate Action Project so far. We don't claim to be definitive experts on climate engagement. Instead, we are a collective of committed community practitioners who are constantly learning ourselves. The project has been delivered with diverse communities within the urban context of the city of Bristol. And we're aware that this may be a contrast with the settings and communities that some of you may be working in. However, we do want to be open and generous about sharing learning and insights from our work in the hope it can usefully encourage other communities embarking on their community climate action journey. And those partners, such as maybe local authorities, supporting communities on that journey. The collective climate action we need to take as individuals, communities, cities and regions is considerable. And so the more we can all share our learning and support one another to achieve rapid carbon reduction in an inclusive way, the better. So I'd just like to kick off by touching on why it is that we think community-led climate action is important. The climate action we take as individuals and households is critically important and the actions of governments, business and local authorities too. But we can't solve the climate and ecological crisis without communities. In Bristol, community has long been key to so much the city has achieved. It's people working together that makes real change happen. With community, we can achieve great things and climate action is no exception. Bristol's community organizations show tremendous leadership during the pandemic. They prove just how essential they are when a city or a place needs to respond to a crisis, demonstrating just why they need to be a critical part of our response to the climate and ecological crises. So just for those of you who don't know, a little bit of a recap um, on the project itself. Over the last 18 months, six diverse Bristol community hub organisations, that's ACH, Ambition Lawrence Western, Bristol Disability Equality Forum, Eastside Community Trust, Heart of the S13 and Lockley's Neighbourhood Trust, co-produced the city's first community climate action plans with and for their communities as part of the Bristol Community Climate Action Project. And they were supported by Bristol Green Capital Partnership, 
Centre for Sustainable Energy, Bristol City Council, and through the National Lotteries Climate Action Fund. Demonstrating the leadership role communities are taking in the city's response to the climate crisis, the plans identified key priorities which will help deliver Bristol's 2030 carbon neutral ambition, whilst also improving the quality of life for local residents as the city recovers from the pandemic and the country attempts to level up inequality in the midst of cost of living crisis. The co-production of the plans involved a diverse community engagement process, working with artists, hosting community meals and presenting radio shows and children's podcasts to start accessible climate conversations with communities. These conversations enable each community partner to create a unique set of climate priorities as part of a comprehensive community plan. The co-production ethos of this process was critical. These plans have been created with, by and for the communities themselves, responding to local needs and issues and engendering genuine ownership. So in summary, the project fundamentals are taking action on climate, taking action on inequality, promoting the leadership of communities on climate and the co-creation of community-led climate action plans using a co-production process. So we thought it might be useful to share a bit um, of our methodology, the process that we went through um, give you a bit of a snapshot of how we went about developing the plans over the last year and a half. So step one, we suggest developing confidence and knowledge about climate change within your community or organisation and access training and mentoring wherever possible. Step two, get to grips with existing climate strategy to develop understanding and confidence of the local, regional and national climate context and agenda. Step three, generate a carbon footprint for your specific community to provide a baseline. This will help you understand where you can have the most significant carbon impact, and you can use the free online impact tool that we'll talk a bit more about later. And it also helps to start meaningful climate conversations with your community. Step four, actively connect with other organizations, decision makers, and climate experts that can support you on your climate action journey. Don't be afraid to ask for help and for information. Step five, collect a snapshot of what your community's current priorities are, both in relation to climate and to quality of life. To help, these will help to you to plan community engagement events. And this could be through simple survey, door knocking, or one-to-one -one community conversations. Step six, start your co-production process. So we suggest hosting a series of inclusive and accessible events and activities and conversations to hear what people think and feel to inform your community climate priorities. This ensures your climate action plan has community ownership and representation. Step seven, develop your own specific priorities based on the community insights gathered during the co-production process. Organize your priorities under specific themes such as energy, building and housing, transport, nature, food, waste, jobs and economy. For each priority, consider its potential collaborators and enablers you want to work with, the resource required both in terms of financial and, and people, the anticipated impact both in terms of climate and community co-benefits, and realistic timescales for implementation of the actions that you propose. Step eight. Share and refine your priorities with local partners, climate experts and decision makers to ensure they're realistic and strategic and to help start building connections with those who can help you implement them. Try and rank your priorities based on both climate and community impacts to help you decide which ones to try and implement first. Step nine, use your priorities as the basis of a community climate action plan document, which also includes key information about your wider community context and the community co-production process you use to develop your priorities. Communicate your priorities clearly to your community to demonstrate to them how their input has helped shape the plan. And then finally, step 10, step, share your community climate action plan and your priorities as widely as possible to help catalyze the process of implementation. 
Realistically, you won't be able to deliver the plan priorities alone, and you'll need to leave a practical, strategic and financial support to help you do so. And so why, if you're a community group, might it be a useful thing to develop your own community climate action plan? Co-creating a community climate action plan with and for a specific community of place or lived experience has the potential to unite a diverse range of different stakeholders around a positive vision for the future of that community and provide a route map for how to turn that vision into reality. A plan helps raise the profile of a community organisation and can open doors to new and different collaborations and sources of funding. It can also help position community organisations as respected climate leaders, increasing the likelihood of genuine engagement and support from external stakeholders and strategic decision makers. Co-produced community climate action plans enable the opinions of a broad range of citizens to be represented in strategic climate conversations and decision making, and can help residents feel like they're part of influencing something bigger and feel empowered to make change locally on an issue that often feels a little too intangible, complex and negative. Plans can also help identify the opportunities for climate action to bring about tangible community co-benefits, which help to improve the quality of life for local people. So what about if you're a local authority, a council or, or someone involved in strategic decision making around climate? How might the creation of community climate action plans be useful to you. Involving communities as core and equal partners can support innovative and ambitious climate action at a city and a regional level. This action is more likely to be successful because it's inclusive, has public support and directly meets immediate local social needs alongside the more abstract and intangible needs of the climate crisis. Community hub organisations are often trusted and relatable messengers who have credibility with their communities. This makes them essential engagement and communication partners for councils and other strategic organisations working on implementing climate strategy. The urgency of the climate and ecological crises necessitates rapid change. The pace of change experienced by citizens will be significant and could result in public resistance which could be detrimental to achieving carbon reduction goals. Integrated community climate action at an early and strategic stage could not only help mitigate this resistance at local level, but actually help accelerate the pace of change needed to meet a city and region's climate targets. However, failure to involve communities in climate action could risk perceptions of consultations and solutions as being imposed from above which can potentially disempower communities and increase the risk of public backlash. Community-led climate action plans and priorities can also provide really useful intelligence and evidence of need for local authorities. This evidence can usefully contribute to the case for support for attracting strategic climate funding and investment to a city or a region, for example, from central government. If you'd like to find out more about the process of creating a community climate action plan um, and or guiding principles for getting started and a little more on the potential benefits, then do check out our new insights report, which is launched today. It shares some of the learning and reflections from the project so far. But just a note that this is the first iteration of the report as we've still got a fair bit of evaluation on the project to do, but we hope some of the learnings will be useful and a direct link is to that is going in the chat now. Stop sharing. Great. Well then, without further ado, I would like to move on to the first of our many fantastic speakers this afternoon. And first up, um, I would like to introduce Harriet Sanson from CSE, the Centre for Sustainable Energy. Over to you, Harriet. Thank you, Amy. Right, I'm going to share my screen and hope that this works. Do that. Now, I just want to check that that's all that looks good. 
Let me know if you can see my notes, but hopefully you can't. That looks um, fine, Harriet. Okay. Thanks. So I am Harriet and I'm from the Centre for Sustainable Energy. So we are a Bristol based charity, in case you don't know, uh, that works on uh, fuel poverty and climate change. And I work in the communities team there. And we um, are a partner on the CAF project in Bristol. And we had a specific role of um, developing carbon footprints for each of the community partners and supporting with looking at how you can measure um, reductions in, emission, in emissions across uh, the community activities. Um, so we created, I'll just briefly say what we did, but what I'm going to actually focus on is how you might go about um, establishing a baseline, a carbon baseline and measuring um, carbon emission reductions and why you might want to do that. Um, so we created a carbon footprint report for each of the um, community partners and we based it on our impact tool, which is a free um, carbon place based carbon footprinting tool uh, that shows emissions um, on both a consumption basis and a territorial basis. Um, and the footprints that we made for the community partners were, were on a consumption basis. So I'm just gonna briefly explain what that means. So that's looking at the carbon emissions that come from the activities that residents in the community uh, take part in. So for example, I'm a resident of Bristol and if I drive my car, regardless of if I'm driving to Scotland, regardless of this, if it's outside of my community, those emissions are still counted towards my community's carbon footprint. There's more detail of this on the IMPACT website and I will share a link to that um, in case you have more questions. Um, so, so yeah, we created a carbon footprint report for each of the um, community partners and which included some more detailed mapping um, just to show them in more detail where emissions um, differ across their community. Um, but what I want to focus on really is, is why why, if you're carrying out a community level um, climate change project or you want to develop a, a community climate action plan, why, why is it a good idea to establish a baseline and why is it important to measure impact? So having a baseline means you know what you're starting with um, and measuring progress is always good because then you can actually understand the impact of activities or projects. Um, and I think that given that climate change is such a huge and overwhelming challenge, being able to actually look at information on where emissions are coming from and being able to track reductions that you're making at the community level can feel empowering. I know for others it can feel disempowering because the scale of the challenge is so huge and maybe um, it's felt that activities are quite small, but I think it's a really, it can be a really empowering thing, just tracking the, the positive change that you're making. Um, so if you look at this, um, the, the two donuts, so this, these is like the footprint information of a community. This is actually the community where I live in Bristol. Um, and that shows, if I look at the detail, it shows me which sectors or activities are the kind of biggest contributors to emissions in my community. So if I look at that left donut, that's showing me emissions in my community on a consumption basis. So I can see the yellow wedge is basically telling me that the biggest con contribution is from the goods and the services that residents in my community consume. And then the orange wedge is food and diet. So the second biggest thing that is responsible for emissions is the food that we eat in our community and the, the emissions associated with the production of that. And then if I look at the next donut, that's the emissions in my community based on a territorial basis. So that's to do with the things that are in my community that don't move about. So, well, some of them do, transport does. Um, so the, the, the biggest bit I can see is the kind of pink red color and that's the housing in my community. So that's the, the, big, the biggest contributor to emissions within my community. And then the next wedge is transport. And I think by looking at where our emissions come from, that can help you focus your attention in terms of where it's possible to make the biggest reductions in emissions. And then you can also see where that might overlap with what the community priorities are and needs are. And the golden areas is where those two overlap because it might be that your community's priorita priorities and interests aren't the areas where you can make the biggest emission savings. Um, so the golden spot is where those two overlap. And I think it's also important because it can reveal how some emissions can be tackled by community activities, but others, and actually quite a lot, 
require more systemic level change. So I think footprint information can be a kind of campaigning and lobbying tool. Um, for some, it's a great way to engage residents. So being able to show them information on what your community footprint is, but also how you're actually reducing emissions. Some residents, some people really like that kind of number side of things and others really don't and it will put them off. So that's kind of a judgment that you have to make. Um, it can be really good way of promoting what you're doing. So using in your communications channels, for example, Eastside Community Trust in our project featured it in one of their magazines, which was really effective. Um, another thing is across a local authority area, looking at how footprints compare across different communities can be a, a really powerful conversation to have looking at kind of how responsibility might differ across different parts of a community. Um, it can be really good in funding applications. If you're applying for funding, be able to say, this is our baseline and this is how we're planning to track the impact that we're having. And then also if you want to engage stakeholders. So for council, engaging your local council or other stakeholder buy-in, being able to show what your baseline is, but also being able to say, we are going to reduce emissions by this much and this will help you in meeting your carbon targets. So how might you go about doing that? Um, in terms of a baseline, there are free tools available and I'll put them all, all of the links that I talk about in the chat after I finish talking. So we have our impact tool, which is um, a tool that we created with XT University and it's free and it's a place-based carbon footprinting tool. And there's another brilliant one called the place-based carbon calculator, which was developed by Oxford University and Leeds University. That's also free. We have lots of great mapping within that tool as well. Um, so yeah, those are two things in terms of establishing a baseline. And then I really recommend coming up with some sort of logic model of how you think the activities that you want to do in your community will actually result in reducing carbon emissions, because then that will clearly show you what activities you need to start tracking to be able to evaluate the impact that you're having. And then how might you actually track the carbon savings of activities that you're doing? Um, so there are lots of um, carbon footprinting tools on an individual basis that can be useful for this. Um, there's There are loads of apps. If you just Google it, you'll find them. Some examples um, are the Resurgence one, uh, WWF have one. Uh, and then also How Bad, Bad Are Bananas is a great book for very, very detailed carbon saving stats. And so you might want to um, get some residents in your community who are taking part in activities to do a kind of before and after footprint to be able to measure the impact of their activities. Um, and if you're doing, for example, a specific um, sector, like if you're tackling transport, um, you can find kind of detailed information on the carbon saving potentials of different um, modal shifts, for example, and that's just stuff you can just find online, but I'm also really happy to share information with people, um, and here is my email address. And so that was lots of information all squished into one, but um, yeah, I am available to answer emails and I will put things into the chat. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Harriet. That's great. And so without further ado, I'm going to move on to um, we've got three trios of fantastic community partners. So in this first section, we are first of all going to hear from Suzanne Wilson from Lockley's Neighbourhood Trust. Over to you, Suzanne. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'm Suzanne from Lockley's Neighbourhood Trust. Um, I run the community centre here and we were part of the Climate Action Programme. And as we're short of time, we're all just kind of going to focus on a little key part of it. Um, and so just starting with build on what's strong in your community. So we were lucky enough to have a community plan. So that was a great place to say what are the things that people care about and what are the big issues for them. Um, also just working with organisations that are based locally. So things like our adventure playground or the churches or the schools and contacting them because probably all of them have had some kind of climate conversation. So it's just where are you at and um, what are you doing about climate? What are your aspirations to do? And are you up for being part of 
a, a group that talks about what that looks like across city and actually everybody we asked from the schools to the churches to the adventure playground were like yeah we're really up for being part of something so i think that's sort of pushing against an open door and then it's just the whole thing is a lot easier if you've got friends <laughs> and you've got other organizations and you can kind of piggyback and make a bit of a movement and then my and i just put i mean 450 conversations and 60 events we were doing this in um a pandemic so we had to think about how you know we gather people together and in and out of various lockdowns and uh, and things like that and so we really focused on a big what we called festival of solutions so we had lots of conversations and then ended in a festival of solutions um and the one thing I wanted to sort of pull out was beware the experts. And uh, this is not because I'm some crazy post-truth, don't worry about facts sort of person, but because um, climate change and doing something about it can feel totally overwhelming. And like, this is such a big problem. It's far beyond any one individual. It's so massive, it feels impossible to change. Um, and that kind of learned helplessness can be really disempowering and, and effectively people's their actual brains switch off and say, oh, this is too big for me. I can't do anything about it and therefore I won't. And experts who are tremendously helpful in pointing to where we should do and what we should do also sometimes help us switch into this. I'm helpless because you know so much more about this than me that I could never make any input into this because you're just so brilliant that you don't need me <laughs> because I'm stupid and I know nothing. And um, so I just think when you're having community conversations, just being aware of people are going to come from totally different places. And we've really got to build up their sense of the potential to do something. And so um, my kind of top tip for that was just focusing on action. And you know, the best way to combat a sense of helplessness is to do something about it. So whether that's a litter pick or just coming along and talking about solar panels or retrofitting or going to a no music on a dead planet and having some of these conversations positive things where people feel like they're making a difference is a really great basis for then saying okay what else what more we can we do and that's where i think sort of combined with that carbon footprint report is really helpful in saying okay now we've got this information where do we feel like we want to focus um, and I was just going to kind of close with in Lockleys we're blessed with this um, you can see that picture in the middle of Stoke Park uh, we've got lots of lovely green spaces and we've got a few farms nearby and there's been quite a lot of development recently so that was a concern about biodiversity and so that was just a really good place to sort of feel our way into conversations because we knew there was energy and passion there and really great assets as well so those are my top tips Great, thanks so much, Suzanne. And next up is Emma Gein from Bristol Disability Equality Forum. Over to you, Emma. Hi, oh, I'm just gonna share my screen. Yeah, everyone can see that, yes. So um, I'm from the Bristol Disability Equality Forum. So we created a community climate action action plan by and for disabled people across Bristol, so um, not based in any particular geographic location. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit to you all about the importance of including disabled people in your work because you're pretty much guaranteed whatever community you're representing, whether that's demographic or geographic, to have disabled people within your community. Um, and excluding us creates really big problems. Um, so in general, we tend to be quite excluded from the climate movement, tend to be one of the communities that are last thought of, which is a huge problem because we're not only one of the groups that are most at risk, uh, in the face of climate change. Um, so the UN recogni recognises our status in, in that respect. Um, and um, to give you uh, w one stat of many, um, we are um, twice as likely to um, die or be hurt by um, natural disasters than any other group. Um, we can also have huge problems created for us by um, mitigation and adaptation um, that doesn't consider our voices. So that's from, you know, road closures that don't consider the needs of people who um, 
have mobility issues to, um, I mean, uh, the example I always use is the plastic straw ban, which I think did reduce like plastic ocean waste by about 0.02%. But um, so it didn't really solve the problem, but created two problems for whom plastic straws are, are a, a necessity for independence. Um, so in Bristol, disabled people make up 14% of the population. That's a kind of and that's not a particularly large percentage. That's kind of roughly what you get across the UK. Um, but we're also, you know, I've, I've talked a bit about how it kind of impacts on us, but also we have the skills that are really important for ad adaptation and mitigation as well. So it's a really important voice to include in your work. So if, if you're a disabled person, that means essentially you're living in a world that's um, unfriendly for you and creates daily challenges for how you can creatively adapt and thrive in it. So those are the kinds of skills that we're gonna need for adapting to the climate crisis. So really important voices to, uh, to have in the room and of course as well I think um, I think often people in the climate movement can be so panicked and so um, thinking so much about the urgency of um, transition um, that kind of climate justice kind of inclusion can be thought of as a sort of nice to have add-on at the end if there's time but actually you can't have transition without climate justice like um, we can't reach net zero if if everyone in our community isn't you know supported and, uh, and enabled to reduce their own their own emissions. So it's an essential essential part of the work. Um, so it's going to the next slide. Um, yeah. So some pointers about how to go about doing that. Um, I think first of all, it's really important to include um, disabled people right from the start. Um, you might want to have a look at our plan um, just as a general pointer about kind of like our recommendations to the whole city. It would be a really good start for um, thinking about how that might interact with your own plan. Um, it's really important to go to where people are, go, go and meet the disabled people in community, don't expect them to come to you. It's, um, you know, this is a community of people who have a huge amount of sort of daily burdens in general and um, doing this work is is often a, a, an extra on top of a, a lot of other difficulties um, so make that work as for them as easy as possible and don't expect them to do it either um, you know maybe if, if you're if you're going out asking them maybe kind of offer something in exchange or or just kind of like make it easy to to for the people who might be interested in that work to come and do it with you um, you might want to have, if you're going to have a steering group for your work, which is really helpful, we definitely found it helpful with ours, um, make sure that you've got at least one disabled person on that group and hopefully more. Um, you might want to look into having a, a disabled champion. Um, and also, yes, be prepared to listen and understand that um, criticism, if it arises, is, is a gift. I think often um, the first thing that you encounter when you're doing this kind of inclusion work is that um, people go, oh, whatever, there isn't time or money or whatever to do that, or, or can get quite defensive um, when obviously, you know, that's the kind of opposite of what we want when we're kind of trying to make sure that inclusive work happens in this area. So um, understand that, you know, if someone's sort of calling you out for anything, that's not a criticism of you as a bad person. We live in an ableist society and basically have, having any critique is basically a gift to saying, hey, you know, this is how we could do it better. And it's not about you failing. This is about, you know, we live in a society with all these problems and this is an issue that's been recognised. Um, so yeah get creative about how you engage people um you know if and and how you how you adapt to problems even if you don't have money to to sort issues that have been raised there's often sort of quick creative fixes around it and as i was saying earlier disabled people are great at those kinds of fixes in terms of having to learn how to adapt to an unfriendly society when there's not money for that on a daily basis um, and then once you've got your, your first draft of your plan, it's really important to make sure that you're getting feedback on that from disabled people as well. Um, and I'll, another thing I'd say is it's it's really, it's so much cheaper to get this stuff right at the start. Like um, instead of, you know, creating your, your projects or your infrastructure and then realizing it's not accessible at the end and then having to tear it all up and redo it, 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 it saves money, honestly, by being inclusive at the start. Um, and, and just a few general accessibility pointers for your events and documentations and that kind of thing. Um, 
I, I, in general, it's really great to have blended events where you can, like there is conferencing equipment that makes that possible now. Um, it, and if you can't do blended sessions, then make sure you're having a, a range of both in-person and uh, Zoom events. Make sure that your venues are accessible. Um, and for big events, make sure that you've got a BSL translator um, to make sure that the deaf community can take part in your work. Um, yeah, have a range of outreach activities. Um, different things are going to be accessible for different people. Um, make sure that if you've got videos to have subtitles on them. I mean, I think that's generally important for engaging people in general. Um, I know lots of people on social media don't want to turn sound on, so video subtitles make sense across the board. And also make sure that you're using alt text on your social media. That basically means if you've got an image, there's like a, a, a textual description that's added. You, all, all social media platforms give you an option to do that in a different part of the menu. Um, that allows um, people with visual impairments to also engage with your content. Um, and your plans make sure that they are created in an accessible way. So use plain English. Um, with this kind of climate work, there's so many complicated terms and jargon, you know, that this kind of is a case for 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 huge amounts of community, not just disabled people. A lot of the words that um, we use in the climate movement are just not accessible. So make sure using plain English, have size uh, 14 font where possible and uh, make sure that the font you're using is accessible. And also when you're quoting your final PDF at the end, make it accessible. So that's basically means that screen readers can use it. So um, that's about kind of creating um, alt text for your pictures um, and also um, creating kind of menu tags within it. But basically, if you if you look in places like Adobe, there should be guides to make sure that you are doing that correctly. But yeah, um, it makes save so much time thinking about this from the start. So thank you. Thanks so much, Emma. Really important and wise words there. Um, next up is Kirsty Hammond from Heart of BS13. Over to you, Kirsty. There she is. I'll just share my screen. Two seconds. One sec. Is it going to work? Two seconds. Sorry about that. Basically, yeah. don't do your presentation on Canva. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can temporarily enjoy the uh, silk painted buildings behind you. Nice That's fine. Drop. I actually don't need um, the slides anyway. It's just some nice pictures. Um, so basically my top tips are around like, don't be afraid to, to really go in deep and see the bigger picture. So disrupting inequality. So, um, and to know, really know your community. So like a lot of the community workers may have um, been really experienced. Like I've, for example, I've grown up all my life in Hartcliffe. So I've seen a lot of the inequality here um, and how it's systemic and transgenerational. Children grow up in a vicious cycle of poverty that in turn incubates the first childhood experiences that go on to affect educational outcomes. Fewer than 2% of young people from this area go into higher education. And so when we considered the climate action plan, we were like, do you know what? Young people are not being included enough. We need to make sure that youth engagement is at the front and center of our plan. So we know that BS13 and young people are, you know, the right way to go with this. So climate change perceptions in children are less susceptible to the influences of worldwide or political context. And then we recognize how it's important for them to inspire adults towards climate concern. And that in turn, there's then this collective action. So for this reason, that's why we were like, we're gonna work with young people. We're gonna be really creative with this. And so that an area like BS13, where engagement in climate action is a lot lower than across the city. So we were like, how can we do this? Let's be creative. We've, we've got a budget. And so um, we actually commissioned seven artists. So we collaborated with schools and non-formal education establishments, um, ranging from primary, secondary, SEN and further education, as well as local youth clubs. We wanted to understand the baseline knowledge that young people had 
on the climate and ecological emergency. So um, by having these seven artists who were given a brief and it was a range of like multimedia activities. So um, we really wanted to use creative thinking to challenge perceptions, amplify their voices and connect with young people with their environment and future opportunities. My um, favorite quote is like, I'm doing climate action through stealth. So, you know, we had beatboxing, um, but it was climate themed. We had drama workshops, um, soft robotics, uh, puppet making, but, you know, that was out of trash and we were learning about plastics in the ocean. So we actually managed to work with over a thousand young people who really got engaged. And I definitely feel like, you know, take a step back because some of the jargon is really complicated and, you know, there's lots of um, anxiety, there can be lots of climate anxiety. So make it as fun and as engaging and kind of like as possible. You know, it needs to be instrumental in education that young people have the knowledge and, you know, and that climate change is at the forefront of where their future is going to happen. Because, you know, 65% of future jobs don't exist yet. Um, and so it's all really about trying to give young people the tools and the knowledge so that they're like oh yeah I'm quite I'm really interested in that or you know yeah why are there supermarket trolleys dumped everywhere and actually that waste goes into the rivers or you know yeah our house is cold and my mum keeps moaning about the electric but if we had solar panels then the energy costs would be down so it's just being creative so that you kind of like drip feed this information into the young people and then they go away and then they they start to process that and think about that and pass that on to the adults um because you know children who learn about the climate and ecological emergency can transfer that knowledge and then this puts issues on the agenda for those adults and it, you know hopefully inspires behavior change so climate action for yourself and um being creative thinking outside of the box and then also like with our community climate action plan um, we made sure that we had it in a variety of forms so the full plan the booklet but what we spent some time on was creating a community summary version and that was through video so we invited a young person to star in that video we used the big plan and the context and all the information that we'd got from all of the sessions and then we shot the video in Hartcliffe in BS13. And so it's so relatable. And then that, that young person gets to, to see that and connect with that. And that's now been shared really widely and I'll share it in the chat. So um, creative tools and like, like Emily just said, making sure that stuff is accessible for all. Um, we had subtitles that were then added onto the video and just being able to share that widely is a, is a great, method and it's something that I'm really glad we took the extra time to do so be creative know your community and don't be afraid to just go for it and think outside of the box and be a little bit bigger because it may just be small steps that you're doing in your community but I can tell you that once you start seeing it connect the dots then it's really important for the young people to see just how far stuff can go thank you very much Sorry, right. I didn't see the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> we can share it afterwards. Thanks so much, Kirsty. Wise words, and yeah, that's all. Get stealthy about our community climate action. Um, so, for your comfort and to mix it up a little bit, and to illustrate the point that communities, in the case of our project, a lot of the work was being coordinated by community hub organisations. But community climate action is um, it, going to happen and needs to happen through lots of individuals doing stuff within that community. And there's a great resource on the Bristol Climate Hub website. There's lots of climate hero stories to, uh, so citizens of stories to inspire other citizens to take action. So just as a, a quick little pause and break, an opportunity for you to perhaps move your body, grab a drink of water, fan yourself with a handmade paper fan. Um, we are just going to take a look at one example of these climate hero stories. So we're going to be hearing from um, Olivia. And Olivia is actually a graduate from our um, Black and Green Ambassadors programme. And she is just going to share a couple of minutes talking um, about how she started community climate conversations in her community. So hopefully Claire will be able to get that up now. So yeah, do take the opportunity just to move around. 
there are lots of groups that aren't included in conversations around climate change. So I'm talking to local community groups around global climate. We live in a connected world. For me, that means think global, act local. You know, there is a global society in Bristol, so you can talk to people on your street and you'll probably learn about how climate is affecting different countries. I'm lucky enough to have a breakfast show here at Ujima Radio, so I get to talk to people every Tuesday morning. I also talk to people in person, so I do a lot of work with lots of different community groups, one of which is a girls group, so we run activities to not only help them learn about it, but also to connect with nature and help generate ideas from such a young age. It feels really great to hear young people's voices and be able to take those messages and share them with people who have the power to create real action and change. Um, that's really powerful. There's definitely an issue around justice with the impacts that the changing climate has. So even in Bristol, that on the global stage is privileged, it is those who are contributing to the problem the least who are suffering the impacts the most. So with something like air pollution, it's generally poorer communities or, or the black community or those who don't have a car <laughs> who are breathing the worst quality air. Um, so that's an issue of justice because um, it tends to be those communities who don't have the power to influence change because they've been cut out of decision making. So part of what I do is signposting people to different community groups um, or action groups um, or resources so that knowledge can be shared, so that we can learn from different voices and so that action and change can be more effective and impactful. Great, and I would encourage you to, um, to check out some of the other Bristol Climate Hero stories. There's a whole series of them on the Bristol Climate Hub website and the link should be going into the chat um, now. So without further ado, our next speaker is Mark Leach from Bristol City Council. And he's going to be talking a little bit about um, a local authority perspective in all of this. So Bristol City Council have been a key partner um, in the project. So bringing a slightly different perspective. So over to you, Mark. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Good, good. OK, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk as, uh, thank you, Amy, um, about the local authority perspective. Um, and um, don't panic, I don't have loads of slides of boring bullet points. Uh, I've got two, I think, of these. But I just wanted to sort of outline some of the roles that uh, councils uh, can, can and should do in terms of projects like this. So one is to be strategic, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Then there's a whole role around enabling and unblocking uh, community development approaches are key to, to good practice and, and working well with communities. Um, it's really important to have good comms, good consultation, good engagement. And it's also just really important um, for individual officers and managers just to be open and receptive. So I mentioned strategy. So we've got the one city climate strategy here in Bristol. Uh, which isn't a council document, as the name suggests, one city is a partnership of all sorts of organisations, including in the voluntary community sector. Um, so that has the 10 themes and the five enabling themes, uh, one of which around engagement. And on the next page, we're not going to go through all this text, don't worry, but I'll put the link in the chat. And you'll see phrases, a lot of phrases about protected characteristics and qualities groups, communities, uh, excluded uh, groups, um, and, you know, I'm not claiming that it's the perfect sort of uh, representation of all this, but um, what I am saying is if you're in a local authority and you're working on climate strategy, just, you know, now is the time to get that. It's one page in the whole strategy, but it's really critical to have this as a hook uh, that other behaviour can follow, uh, other actions, sorry, can follow afterwards. Um, so that's the climate action strategy. I've just opened a link, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, what? so my role, uh, I was involved right at the beginning in terms of the bid and throughout the project. Um, I'm actually in the uh, sustainability and climate team, but I've got a community background and that's probably quite, um, quite important. But yeah, we as a council supported the bid. Um, and I think that's something that councils should be doing. Uh, obviously it's paid for itself because um, we've got the lottery money uh, but you know there are other areas that won't have lottery money where we still plan to work with communities and other groups as well 
Providing data and evidence and information is a really important part of, of my role and colleagues uh, during this, this work. Um, uh, the green ones, by the way, I'm going to talk about in future slides. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the comms we've done and amplifying. Uh, well, you've already seen the video uh, just now. Um, I'm going to talk about platforms. Well, there's one right here. There's a photograph of the uh, Climate Change Committee coming to, to uh, Bristol. And we played a, a small part in, in ensuring that um, communities got to speak. So you can see uh, Emma and Kirsty there. Um, we've also provided speakers at events. So uh, I think my colleague, my manager, Alex, uh, and colleague Ian, I think, and, and potentially others uh, have been at various events um, and also providing, I've just realized also some of the bigger events um, as well as specific community events, sort of the big round table uh, peer review type events. We had lots of people there as well. So you need, you need to have someone within the organization, within the council, who's gonna be that, that person who, who uh, gets the buy-in of colleagues to attend those events because as you'll know your colleagues are incredibly busy uh, and this is you know taking hours out several hours out to attend events like that is tough uh, so it's good to have someone there to help um, just reassure them and, and, and convey the value of that. Connections I'm going to talk about in the next few slides uh, the level of knowledge and expertise obviously in the organizations is vast um, and sometimes perhaps uh, not always realized um, within communities uh, and then some project specific stuff so uh, with one of our wonderful community partners and looking at sort of land ownership issues at the moment and connecting with colleagues there and we've even provided film locations for, for one of the community partners films as well it helps with that so the first thing um, this is the roundhouse Kirsty will be very familiar with this amazing building but it's just to say that some of the prep work so years before the bid I remember going down here and talking to residents uh, not this particular group um, and you know, hearing lots of stories like um, one woman who said, "How am I even going to do my recycling when there's uh, drug dealing at an industrial scale going outside my back door?" And since then, I've heard many other stories about um, a woman who, you know, there's a message you're considering campaigns, perhaps around maybe leaving the car at home, but um, met a vulnerable young woman with mental health issues who she actually said the car was the only place she sort of felt safe and in control. Or you might be talking about. Um, buying organic food, uh, but you've got to think about a family who maybe want an unexpected bill away from the food bank. So I think having that, that knowledge and going and talking to communities and listening, well, listening really, not talking is important, but also listening and understanding is incredibly important. So yeah, and then that's channeling itself through to our whole wider One City Comms and engagement, climate engagement approach, um, which um, this is part of. So this, you've seen Olivia's film already, there she is at the bottom. Um, and there's a whole load of others and you can see the community partners who've nominated the people. So we've got, you know, 20 odd films out on the hub and there's more to follow, but it's fantastic that at least six of those have got real ties to the communities uh, within the Community Climate Action Project. And it goes further because we then had posters around uh, the city. So uh, we're telling the stories of, of groups and communities have often been maybe excluded or uh, what was Olivia's phrase cut out of decision making um, but you know we're also thinking about well who are we telling those stories to and I think you know we're partly telling them to the wider city as well. Um, making connections um, just remember that probably someone in the council wherever you are wants this as much as you do so the trick is to find them I'm not saying that's easy uh, I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, if, if they don't have time um, then you know you might need to work with a number of officers and um, build a timeline uh, and it's worth remembering there's as many misconceptions on the community side about the council as there are on the council side about the community and part of your role if you're going to be uh, on the council side is to kind of help to to work both ways on that one and be be a connector yourself. Just to remember that when you're inside the council uh, you know you, you start to get uh, after a while to learn your way around but for people outside it's just it can just be bewildering and this is just a list of external facing things on our website a few years ago uh, and you can see just how bewildering that list so it's very very difficult for people to navigate and that's a key role uh, for a connector um, is to be um, is to help kind of navigate help people navigate through through the sort of um, the council and any large organization um, and then um, yeah, I mean, just finding the right person. I think there's people who've got the time, people who've got the inclination and people who've got the relevant skills and knowledge. But uh, if you can find that magic bit in the middle, then um, 
uh, then obviously doing well. Um, so um, when you're working uh, within a local authority, probably goes for other agencies as well. I think there's two really important things not to assume, and I know I'm echoing Donna and Emma's points here. Don't assume that climate change is a priority for your residents, for residents or local people, but don't assume that residents aren't concerned about climate change. There's absolute concern and relative concern. And um, you, know, you can see across Bristol, there isn't actually that much difference. It's not like a dramatic change in climate change from the wealthiest. Uh, this isn't in order of wealth, this is in order of concern. Um, but you know, if you go and say to someone, hey, what's your top concern? They're not gonna say climate change often, but if you find out, if you chat to them and you talk about their concerns and then you're talking about climate change, you'll usually find actually they are concerned about climate change. So yeah, uh, there's a fantastic piece on this by Mike Linus, lots of words. Don't worry, I'll put a link in, but it's absolutely, I just think it nails it. Um, but yeah, just to conclude, don't assume that climate change is a priority for local people. Don't assume that they're not concerned about it. It seems contradictory at first, but hopefully I've explained that in the short time I have. I'm looking down at my stopwatch as I talk. Britain Talks Climate. So Suzanne already mentioned um, climate outreach. This is one of their tools and it's really helped me and, and other officers to kind of think, to get beyond um, sort of just the easy stereotypes about when we're engaging, we're working with, with partners and start to think about people outside maybe traditional class or other limiting, rather limiting sort of views. Uh, probably got to be careful with all sorts of anything that, that segments, but, but climate outreach, you've got some fantastic tools just to echo what Suzanne said and said that we're using this in the city council and it's it's been really, really helpful. And then finally, uh, uh, why is this all important? Amy asked me to say this. Well, I think the two key points are that climate councils can't get to their 23rd goals without communities. And I think it's fair to say that communities can't achieve many of their goals without councils. So I think it's absolutely essential. And then I noticed actually, Amy, you kind of covered these far better probably, but there is something about the reach and impact that you will get as an organization working with trusted community partners, trusted by their communities, I mean here. Uh, and also just the, the kind of key that um, informing policy and service delivery to avoid those unintended consequences. Uh, I mean, the one Emma talked about with the straws is national, but I think, you know, we can all think of examples of that locally as well. Um, so I believe, yeah, that's me. That's me done bang on time. I shall stop sharing. Great, thanks very much, Mark. Really good to have that additional picture. So without further ado, um, I would like to transition over to our next trio of community partners who I'm going to have to ask to keep it as brief as you can. I know you're, you're kind of well versed so that we have got time, plenty of time for questions. So I will hand over quickly um, to Emily from Eastside Community Trust. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Amy. Um, let's see here. Hopefully you can all see that and you can hear me as well. So really happy to be with you here all today. Um, I work with Eastside Community Trust and I'll be sharing some learnings about how we can talk about climate in ways that help to bring more people into the conversation and motivate them to get involved in climate action. Um, so we are a community hub based in Eastern Lawrence Hill and we have a long history of sharing information with residents from quite diverse backgrounds in our local area using a range of channels like our community notice boards, social media, radio shows, our Freedom Kids podcast, which you can see being recorded in the in the photo here, um, and our quarterly Up Our Street magazine that is delivered to every household in our local area. So we have a lot of experience getting information out to our communities about things happening locally, but climate was pretty new to us when we started our engagement process. So this has been a bit of a learning process. Um, luckily, there are a lot of really great tools and resources available to support on this journey. Uh, it's starting to feel like a bit of a climate outreach promotional event here, but their guides were really helpful to us. Um, and we were also lucky to be able to participate in the first cohort of Media Trust's Weston Communicating Climate um, Training Program for charities, which I can link to in the chat. Um, so drawing on these different resources and our own communications experiences, we wanted to figure out a path forward that would make the topic feel important and urgent enough for people to give it their attention when there's so much else going on, but also keeping it positive and empowering so people would feel like it was actually even worth their time and headspace to get involved in the first place. So I think as it's already been discussed um, throughout the afternoon at the foundations of this all is the importance of the language that we, that we use and using clear accessible language. So quite often people can feel instantly excluded from conversations around climate action simply due to barriers created by unfamiliar technical language. So in some cases, jargon is just jargon, 
and can and should be taken out completely and it won't affect your messaging. But that doesn't mean that we should avoid all technical language when talking to our communities. To be able to participate in citywide conversations and to take advantage of opportunities for things like home energy retrofits and green jobs, people need to know what these words mean and to be able to use them. Language is power, you know, we've all heard that and it's true. And for this reason, we try whenever possible to include clear, accessible definitions and written communications, like our jargon buster in the edition of the magazine where we talked about climate um, and making sure that our own team and partners take the time to explain language when we're out talking to people about these topics so that they feel like they can use it effectively. Um, in terms of messaging and the ideas we're trying to get across, it's been really important to move away from the idea that people's health and well-being is separate from the health of the planet which we know are so actually so deeply linked. So we focused on how we can address both at the same time, rather than setting up a false idea of either or that forces people to feel like they have to choose one or the other. The title of our, our community climate action plan is Healthy People, Healthy Planet for a Reason. And this language has been really effective throughout our engagement process. Another barrier that we've encountered for people engaging in climate action can be a feeling that it's now actually too late to make a difference. While it's really necessary to communicate the urgency of the situation, we found that it's also important to emphasize that this isn't a yes or no question of will climate change happen or not, um, but to frame it more in terms of the impact we can still have on our future and what can still be possible if we take action now rather than continuing to wait and thinking it's, it's just too late. Um, so lastly, people really need to see themselves in this movement. This means meeting people where they're at on the journey and helping them to identify roles they can play and celebrate things that they're already doing and things that exist in their traditions and, and cultures um, that are positive towards climate action. And it also means using images and voices and storytelling that represent the broad cross section of people who make up our community and the actions being taken here. So no more Googling for stock images of environmentalists. We need to have images that people can see themselves in and that actually show that things are happening in your community already. This will also help to normalize climate action and will make people feel like they're part of something larger and not just going it alone. Um, so those are a few of the top tips and happy to answer additional questions in the Q&A, but I'll hand it back to you now, Amy. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Emily. Really, really important and interesting insights share there. So next up is Tom Dixon from ACH. Over to you, Tom. Hopefully, you there, Tom? Oh, there he is. Yes, sorry, what are two technical issues? Can you see my presentation? Is that the slides yeah. are showing? Uh, oh, not yet, not yet. No. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> now? Not yet. Oh, yeah, coming, coming on. Great. Oh, Cool. Hi everyone, so I'm Tom Dixon, I'm the research and project leader at ACH um, and we worked with um, the demographic community of place um, of refugees in Bristol um, in creating the community climate action plan. So I thought um, as, as for this presentation I'd provide kind of five um, key takeaways that we took from, from the work that we've done um, and then follow that up with some kind of ideas for the future. So, sorry let me just get the next slide. So firstly, the experience. So for the refugee communities that we're working with, their experience of climate change um, is very different to the experience that, that uh, you or I may have. Um, climate change for a lot of people working with is, is, is an immediate concern, a concern or a, a reality that may have led to them or contributed to the reasons why they fled their country of origin. They may have um, relatives remaining in those countries who are experiencing major impacts from climate change as we speak in terms of famine, in terms of drought, in terms of crop failures, and in terms of food insecurity and so on. So this, 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 this kind of um, immediacy of experience needs to be reflected when, when working with, a ref, with, with refugee communities in relation to climate change. Um, impact. So in terms of now looking at, at the refugee communities resident in the UK, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, there was a report produced into the climate footprint of some of our service users. The climate footprint of, of, of a refugee is significantly lower than that of the average um, British born resident of the UK. So again, looking at this, why we shouldn't be therefore asking those individuals from those communities to make significant lifestyle changes when the impact they're having in terms of the climate overall climate footprint of, of Bristol or of the UK 
um, is, is, is smaller than, than yours or eyes might be. Um, collaboration. So obviously, in order to create the community action plan, we work in collaborati collaboratively with um, refugee and migrant communities from across Bristol. Um, however, this collaboration needs to be long term. This collaboration needs to be truly collaborative, simply focus groups, simply uh, paying lip service to that kind of views of those communities is not enough. We shouldn't go into those conversations believing that we know what those communities want, but we should be able to um, truly listen to and truly take on board their um, opinions and views. Uh, value. So this is about the value that, that we place on the, on the views that are coming out from those communities. Um, effectively, if in creating this climate community climate action plan, um, individuals from refugee communities have been our consultants, they've been our experts, they've been our um, partners in this creation, and as such, their time needs to be valued, um, and the work that they've put into the project needs to be valued. Um, and that comes on further into something I'll talk about later around, around the priorities from those communities. So, and then finally, the benefits. So alongside, obviously, the, uh, the difficulties that climate change will create, there are, there are benefits that are coming out from the uh, move towards a green economy, from new employment opportunities to address climate change, whether that's within Bristol or, or more widely. Um, the access and the uh, equity of access to those financial benefits is, is something that's come out from the communities that we work with as, as something that they are really valuing. So if we look at the last slide around sort of key priorities going forward, equitable access to green opportunity um, was a, a major uh, priority for, from, from the individuals that we worked with in terms of being able to gain the skills and gain the uh, experience necessary to access green jobs of the future. Um, and beginning that work now before we kind of move in towards those those kind of economic um, opportunities being created, and then and finally something that, that I've kind of spoken about before again recognition of, of where the primary responsibility for climate change lies. It's not with refugee communities. It's not with with poorer citizens of the UK in general, but it's with, with it's with businesses. It's with larger consumers. It's with those individuals, and and that needs to be kept at the forefront of any um, action that we're seeking to take to address climate change. Um, cool. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. And without further ado, uh, last but by no means least, I'll hand over to Donna Seely from Ambition Lawrence Weston. Thanks, Donna. Thank you, Amy. Can I just please double check that that looks OK? Yes, that looks splendid. Excellent. So. If you are at the event today, then that means you are starting to think about writing your own community climate action plan or delivering some community level climate action project within your local neighbourhood. That may seem like a huge thing to do and quite daunting. And you may be asking yourself, where and how do I even begin? So that was us back at the beginning of 2020. We began our journey with the other community partners and the realisation of what this meant for Lawrence Weston. And how on earth do we even begin conversations around the climate crisis during the time when a worldwide pandemic was on the brink? Where and what is our starting point and how do we begin to engage local residents on the topic of the climate and ecological emergency when there was another emergency much closer to home that was impacting people? And after being told we were now in a lockdown with no end date in sight, it was a precarious time and we had to strategically think about our messaging during this uncertain time for everyone. So my top tip is recognise actions that are already happening in your community that positively link to climate action. And we had to change the way we approached our engagement due to COVID. So we wrote our engagement plan before Boris announced lockdown to reach local residents during our co-production phase of writing our plan. So where did we begin? At Ambition Arts Western, we have great existing relationships with other organisations within the communities, such as local schools, churches, voluntary sector organisations, resident-led groups, local businesses. And your first starting point is to develop what's called an asset map of your local neighbourhood. And there's a great model on your screen. And this is a good reference of how to do this. 
This is where you can understand your neighbourhood and potential weigh-ins for your engagement. And this is where we began. We knew we would never be able to co-produce a robust climate action plan for Lawrence Weston without other people's expertise to ensure we reach the diverse cross-section of the community. So my top tip is don't think you have to do this on your own. Think about all the other assets within your local neighbourhood that you can draw on to help you co-produce your plan. What groups can you link into? What organisations are there that can help? What local leaders are within your neighbourhood? Once you have your assets mapped on your local neighbourhood, you can then plan your engagement process. You need to think of a range of engagement activities relative to the groups or organisations that you want to engage. So, for example, if you want to engage young people, then you might want to work with the local youth club, do an activity with them. If you want to engage young parents, you might go to the local toddler group. If you want to engage your local planning group, you might want to do a presentation or a workshop. Planning your calendar of engagement needs to be wide ranging and at different times to ensure you can include as many people as possible. So my top tip is frame the issues in terms of what your community cares about. Climate has the potential to connect with everything. And another top tip, developing a community climate action plan might sound like something you've never done before. But actually, you need to think if you've ever written like a climate action plan or a community development plan, then the process is the same but plan your engagement activities accordingly. So before I end my slot, and I, and I just wanted to leave with you some more top tips that I have personally learned on my own journey. So number one, build, your, build on your existing strengths within your neighborhood. Number two, ensure you plan ahead and give yourself enough time for each stage of developing your plan. Three, know when to ask for help. Recognise other people's expertise, as well as recognising your own limitations. No one is the expert at everything. Four, share the workload. You will not be thanked for burning yourself out. And number five is enjoy. As much as it's hard work, enjoy the process and congratulate yourself on your plan once it's written. Bristol really is leading the way on community-led climate action, and you can also be part of that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Donna. Um, some fantastically useful top tips to end on there. Um, right, without further ado, we're going to transition on to the Q&A. So if I can ask all of our speakers to just unmute and come back onto screen, we'll go into gallery view. And um, as ever, that we didn't, there's never, don't build in enough buffer time. So the Q&A is shorter than you imagine, but we've still got a good chunk of time. So we've had quite a lot of pre-submitted questions that have come through in advance of the event. So we will kick off um, with those. So I am going to pick this one first, which is what motivates community members the most to engage with community-led climate action? Okay, and hopefully Lizzie's able to pop that one in the chat. And I'm gonna ask Suzanne whether she might be up for um, responding to that one first. So it's what motivates community members the most to engage in community-led climate action? Um, so I guess I've got three answers for this. One is uh, we love to bribe people with food and fun activities. So a good party, barbecue, fun time is a good way to get people together. Um, and uh, two, I guess, is just... Um, that every community will have some amazing people in that have a particular thing that they're passionate about. So whether that is, um, you know, we've got someone who knows loads about ecology and tells really great stories in Stoke Park. We've also got someone that was really passionate about urban railways and got everyone talking about Lockley's urban railway. And so I think just start off your conversations on a bit of a treasure hunt and be thinking like, how am I just going to find these treasure hunts of these people who are passionate about a particular kind of dimension and don't be like, we're only talking about transport today. So don't come and talk to me about plastic bottles. Just be like, let's have start off at the beginning with some really wide open questions and really inviting people in to talk about whatever thing they want. And then, just go where that energy was. And I said three things, but I can't remember the third. So 
I'll text it in the chat. <laughs> they were they were two very good things. So that that counts as three. Um, and is there anything anyone else would like to add to that before? Well, we'll jump on to the next one. We'll try and cover as many as we can. And I should also just say apologies um, from Kirsty, who's had to leave us early because she's got to go and meet at the, the US Embassy in London. So um, she sends her apologies, but she's very happy to take questions via email after the event. So next up, um, how do you include people from all backgrounds and encourage them to take action? And this is something that all of you have done. I'm going to ask Emma to kick off with that one um, and then perhaps ask others to follow up. Yeah, I, I think this one is a matter of um, start by kind of like thinking about, OK, who are the people we really need to make sure are in this room, are at the table? Look, at who's not like the gaps in who's on your group and then um, make a real active effort to go out and meet these people where they are. And that's kind of in a variety of different ways. So geographically, like going to the places where these people are already gathering, um, but also meeting them in terms of where what they are currently thinking and feeling about climate change um, and kind of thinking about the kinds of language that you're using to engage them. So I, mean, I think Mark was saying, you know, it might not be everyone's priority, but everyone cares about climate change. And I think one of the ways in there is in terms of thinking about how you're connecting it with their, their what they say is their top priority. Because I think I, I was talking to um, someone from the environmental movement about this project and they were looking at the plans and they're saying, oh, you keep on talking about equity, but there's so little talk about climate change or, you know, these other issues. And I'm saying, actually, you know, that that's, that's the problem with the environmental movement at the moment. It kind of thinks that, you know you just have to keep on hammering on about climate change when climate change is behind everything and it's about kind of helping people to see how the issues that they care about are being worsened or, or could be improved by action on climate change in um in that way so yeah for, for us it was you know instead of shelling, yelling about climate change all the time it was talking about okay well you know the community of disabled people cares a lot about transport so let's talk about transport and how um if we want to reach net zero and we want in the city then this is an issue we need to focus on so yeah meet people where they're at is my 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 advice there and um go do the active work instead of expecting them to come to you great thanks emma and i'm gonna i've got a kind of connected question so i'll follow up with that one um and this is you know this is something which is quite rightly leveled at the climate and environmental sector um it, it is not representative of our society so how can we make community climate action relevant to people other than the white middle classes that dominate this agenda? And I will maybe ask Tom and then Emily if they would like to share a couple of thoughts on that. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, I think this kind of like follows on from, from what um, Emma was saying as well. I think the easiest way to include any diverse community, um, whether that's refugees or, or anybody else within the climate conversation, is, is to employ people from those communities. The easiest people to access any community are people who are members of that community, right? So at um, ACH, we're fortunate that around 50 to 60% of our staff come from a refugee background. Um, they are members of those communities already. So the, the issues with access quickly fall away if you are recruiting and employing individuals from those communities to do that work. Thanks, Tom. Emily, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really critical piece of it. It's also, I think, um, one piece of the project going forward that we're hoping to work on is training up existing leaders um, rather than going from climate leaders and bringing them into the community, training up the leaders that already exist in your community from all different backgrounds. Um, also, starting with really open conversations that are not judgmental, not making people feel like they're not doing things, you know, highlighting what people are doing, looking at different traditions um, and cultural practices that do exist so people identify with, with the movement um, rather than feeling like they're not doing things. Because um, I think for a lot of people we spoke with, they felt like they were seen as part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And that's a really important piece is making sure that people both are perceived and perceive themselves as part of um, climate action and solutions. Great, thank you both. So swiftly on to another question. I'm gonna pose this one to Donna, if that's okay. Um, and someone has asked the ever present question of how much do you start from the fundamental requirement to reduce carbon emissions and how much do you start with the fundamental requirement to base the plan on communities own priorities mm. how do you get that balance right 
Yeah, I no, I think that's really important and something that we, you know, we're really keen at Ambition Northwestern um, to do is to, you know, ensure the improvements of health and well-being to everyone living in Lawrence Western and how can we improve everyone's day-to-day -day lives. So kind of everything that we do is is kind of based around that. And then those re reduction in carbon emissions come as like a secondary outcome of the, the work that we're doing. So you know, things like gardening projects, you know, this is all about making Lawrence Western feel better and making green spaces more accessible, making the place look better. But actually what comes with that is, you know, cleaner air, improving the wildlife. So, you know, is what we do is kind of frame our work on what we're calling the co-benefits. So how is that improving everyone's day-to-day -day life? And the reduction in carbon emissions comes as our secondary outcome. Thanks, Donna. And obviously, you know, it will vary depending on demographics of communities. Um, I know we've got quite a spread of people in the audience today from across the West of England region. Um, great. I am going to jump in. I'm going to ask Mark a question next. So because I know there's members from other kind of local authority and parish councils and that kind of thing in the audience. I've got a question here is, has Bristol City Council done any work, wider workforce development on how to engage communities successfully, so sort of asset-based community development, that kind of thing, that enables them to work with community groups and the voluntary sector on an equal footing and give up power and resources to them? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think the answer, like so often, is, is yes, we have, uh, but probably nowhere, like, nowhere near uh, enough of what we need to do to really address the uh, the issue probably in the way you'd like to see. So yeah, um, I've been on um, an ABCD course, um, which was great. It's kind of a refresher from a lot of the community development stuff I'd done sort of 20 years ago. And uh, there were lots of colleagues from all around the council from housing services and uh, all, all sorts of different departments, which is fantastic. Um, it was quite a few people. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it, it was, it was tens. Um, I can't remember exactly because it was divided into groups, um, but, Clearly, you know, I suppose the question is, how far would you go? There are 6,000 employees and uh, most of them are extremely stretched. Um, and we know, we all know that there's a benefit to doing that um, and it, it can pay back for that time. But the challenge obviously is in any organisation um, is, is, is trying to figure out how many people uh, would you train in that and then figuring out how to get the money and the time to do that but yeah we've made a good start I think so um, and I'd, I'd really encourage I found the benefit myself saw it in colleagues and I think everyone all of us who went on the course would probably advocate councils doing more of that. Great thanks Mark um, so I'm conscious is that we also said that we would respond not only to some of the pre-submitted questions for those of you that are organised, but some more spontaneous ones. So I am going to take the question from Phil Spencer, um, if it's in the Q&A. So looking from London, enviously, Bristol looks like a great patchwork of many communities. Do you ever get together and collectively strategise as leaders? Is there a central singular Bristol climate action hub? Would this even be useful, question mark? Does this network connect to the local councillors and wider political action? And I, I mean, who would like to come in on that? I think Mark would probably have some responses to that. Does anybody else like to? Suzanne, let's kick off with you, thanks. Um, I guess one of the things that's kind of interesting when we started this project right back at the beginning when Bristol Green Capital Partnership and the council were setting it up and there were lots of people from like what I would call subject specific or expert specific things who were like oh I've got this brilliant idea for like energy or renewable energy or retrofit can't we just do something centrally and get all the communities to come along to that because that would be much more effective at getting their particular thing and and the way that this co-production thing worked was to say actually let's totally flip that on its head because traditionally these things are managed quite centrally whether that's by a local authority or by Westminster or whatever and for people most of these are communities that feel quite excluded from some of that what I will call city centre conversation although obviously it doesn't all happen in the city centre um, and so we were like actually we've got to take this conversation out into our communities and have it there first even if it's 
not as expert and as brilliant and have the greatest minds because we've just got to get some local buy-in and action and then we can marry it with the expertise and, and with the brilliance and really kind of shoot for the moon um so i would just be really careful about that can't we just bring everyone together because some of what um you know it's interesting my area often talks about feeling like the forgotten estate and so does Donna's and so does Kirsty's, and that's just a narrative for some of our communities so just being like can't we just all get together is just something to be a bit careful about and as most of us are charities we have to be really careful about the politics as well so we can't get into kind of big p political stuff that said we're all crying about not getting together more frequently and partly that has just been covid and restrictions on numbers so we love to get together and we're getting together i think next week and we're like stop making us do work amy we actually just want to talk to each other because it'll be really lovely to spend some time together so we don't get together enough but also like be careful about thinking about it'd be great if everyone gets together in the center because actually some of what we're trying to do is say spend some time out in the sticks Oh, great. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And uh, sorry, I'm such a slave driver. Um, <laughs> we'll have some fun at the Roundhouse soon. Um, well, I'm conscious that we're very close to time. We've got a few things just to wrap up in terms of sharing some next steps. So um, I'm sorry we haven't got around to all of the questions. I would encourage you to carry on the conversation on Twitter and we can share contact details of all of the partners. Um, we're all very keen to, to, to help and support other um, community organisations. Um, so I'd like to say a big thank you to our panellists and audience for your interesting and provoking questions. I just wanted to say a little bit about what next. So this project has developed the kind of leadership of six of Bristol's community diverse organisations and enabled them to develop their own community plan action plans. But there are many other wards in the city. So what about those other communities, both within Bristol and beyond? So a few things that, that we're doing to try and help support other communities are, first of all, um, we, we're going to be hosting a community climate surgery event. So we're keen to share the learning from our community climate action journey to support and enable others to develop their community led response to the climate and ecological emergencies. So we'll be hosting a community surgery at the new heart of BS13 roundhouse that you saw a picture of in uh, Mark's presentation in Hartcliffe on the 6th of July. This smaller in-person event aims to give other Bristol-based community organisations and community leaders a chance to have one-to-one -one conversations with project partners and to get more detailed advice and resources to support them as they start out on their community climate action journey and, and begin to develop their community climate action plans. So the link to that event is in that's going in the chat now. And then later this year, we'll be developing a broader learning and mentoring programme that will support and enable a further 10, uh, 12, sorry, community organisations with their climate action journeys. And to put communities at the heart of city's decision making, we are going to be establishing a new commu community leadership panel on climate and just transition. So these two strands of work are currently in development. So do please keep an eye on Bristol Green Capital Partnership communications channels over the next few months to find out more. And the best way to do that and to keep in touch with us is to sign up for our email newsletter, link in the chat now, um, and also following us and all of the community partners on social media. And don't forget, of course, there is version one of our insights report um, to give you more information. Some of these collective fabulous sort of insights and learnings from the work that's gone on so far. Um, so that's just gone live today, um, link in the chat. And to accompany that, we're also publishing a weekly blog from each of the community partners. So already shared some great reflections from Emma, from Donna um, and from Emily. And there's a new one from, that's gone live today from me and we'll have more to follow over the next month. So we'd really encourage you to check those out. I'd also like to um, just highlight some great resources that have been developed through a parallel Green Capital project, our Climate Action Programme for Businesses. Um, so there's lots of resources that have been developed through that that can be really useful to community organisations. Um, and there's a link to those going in the chat now. And finally, the thank yous. So I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers, not only for sharing their reflections today, but also for their fantastic community leadership over the last 18 months. 
We'd also like to thank the National Lottery's Climate Action Fund for enabling us to undertake this really important work here in Bristol. My thanks to all of the Bristol Green Capital team for supporting the organisation and the, the digital hosting of this event so ably this afternoon. And finally, of course, a really big thank you to all of you in the audience. Sorry, we can't see you um, this afternoon for bringing your thoughtful questions to discussion. We really hope you found the event useful and that in some way it can help encourage and catalyse more community climate led action within Bristol and the wider rest of England region. So please do get in touch with any and all of us if you have any further questions or any ideas for collaboration. But for now, we wish you a lovely rest of the afternoon. Thanks for, for spending some of your Wednesday afternoon with us. And goodbye and good luck if you are starting out on your community climate action journey. Thanks, everyone. Take care.